good day and welcome to the Alma Rules Full Year 2019 Financial Results and Business Update presentation. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Pablo Deverson. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Jody. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Almiral Full Year 2019 Financial Results Conference Call. This presentation was released earlier this morning and is available on our corporate website. Presenting today, we have Peter Gunter, Chief Executive Officer, Mike McKellen, Executive Vice President, CFO, and Busan Hanak, Executive Vice President, Research and Development, CSO. Peter will make some introductory remarks about the year and later come back to sum up. Busan will update you on our pipeline and Mike will provide you on the, with detail on the financials and 2020 outlook. After that, we will open up for a Q&A session. Before we move ahead, I would like to remind you that certain statements that we will make in this presentation are forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements reflect Almira judgment and analysis only as of today and results may differ materially from current expectations based on a number of factors affecting our businesses. So with that, I will pass you over to our CEO, Peter Gunther. Thanks a lot, Pablo, for the introduction and good morning to everyone on the call. 2019 has been a very strong year for Almiral, both from a financial perspective and in terms of pipeline progress. We had a strong business momentum driven by our growth drivers, and we are pleased to have delivered our upgraded EBITDA guidance which we provided at half one. I will give you additional information later in this presentation on the growth drivers. Notable late stage pipeline progress included Lebrikizumab commencing phase three clinical trials, and we expect to announce the complete filing of Tirbanibulin before the end of the quarter. Additionally, as you are aware from our announcements at the beginning of the year, we have signed an option agreement to acquire Bionis Therapeutics, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company, and we have signed two strategic collaboration agreements with 23andMe to license rights to other bispecific monoclonal antibody and Wuchi Biologics for multiple bispecific antibodies targeting dermatology diseases. We have announced the acquisition of the China rights of Saisara, and we will initiate phase three later this year. I will elaborate a bit more on this in my presentation. Furthermore, critical to any organization is the capability and people within, and we are pleased that we continue to attract key talent to Almiral, like Volker Koschelny, Chief Medical Officer, who has started in January, joining us from Celgi. As I mentioned, we are pleased to deliver a strong set of financials and achieve our upgraded EBITDA guidance following good performances from key brands and improved product mix, driving an increase in gross margin. Almiral starts 2020 with a good credit rating, reflecting our operational flexibility and healthy balance sheet, whilst we actively pursue other acquisitions and late stage in licensing opportunities that align with our corporate strategy. Taking a step back in our transformation journey of the last two years, I think it's fair to say that Almiral is fundamentally a different company than what it was a couple of years ago. There has been and will continue to be a transformation of the business. New Almiral, if I may call it like that, starts with the launch of Skill Events in October 17, which was our first launch in Psoriasis in Europe. We then made the first in licensing deal for a new mode of action in actinic keratosis, which is a precancerous and very frequent disease in medical dermatology. At that time, it was in phase two, and I'll come back to you shortly on where the product is now. A very important turning point was the acquisition of the medical dermatology portfolio of Allergan in the US in August 2018, which came with an innovative novel antibiotic for moderate to severe acne. As you know, I'm talking about Cesara, which was then launched in January 2019. We had our first launch of a biologic in Europe with Ilometri. Then, very significant in our view, we entered into an option deal with Dermira to acquire the European rights on Lebrikizumab, an anti-IL-13 for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. When we saw what we thought to be very interesting data, we exercised the option, giving us unrestricted access to what we think has best in disease potential in this indication. And of course, recently, Lily acquired Dermira, 
which we view very positively for Almiral. Firstly, it validates the hypothesis that indeed Leprechizimab is a very interesting molecule. And secondly, with the power of Lilly behind this brand in terms of medical affairs, evidence generation, evidence dissemination, life cycle management, etc., which of course also ought to be very helpful to us in Europe. We announced a number of deals at the beginning of the year, including Bionis and 23andMe, which Bouchan will elaborate on later. So this is really where we are today, focusing on these launches and building a real pipeline of innovation for severe unmet medical needs in medical dermatology. Going forward, we are excited about and working towards key launches of future growth drivers with the launch of Tirvanibulin in Europe and the US in 2021. The following years, we will be expanding Caesara's geography by submitting in 2023 in China and launching Lebrikizumab in Europe in 2023. All this points towards significant midterm value to be unlocked. Now, turning to the launches, we are very pleased to see the performance of our recent launches. Skillerent has completed the European rollout, achieving good penetration and captured significant market share in the key markets of Germany and Holland within the Fumerate class. Ilometri has performed well in the last quarter of the year with strong unit growth quarter on quarter. We are encouraged by this momentum, which we expect to continue after having negotiated the final price with the GBA in Germany. Saisara finished the year with 6% TRX market share. From the second week of January, we changed our PAP program and we have seen an expected decline in TRX, which is totally aligned with our internal expectations. I will give you more details on this later. In 2019, we had 6,200 6, dermatologists prescribing Saisara and a total of more than 200,000 prescriptions. Turning to Skillerens, Germany and Holland are clearly showing very strong market shares. You can see from the slide those impacts of those two launches with quite immediate impact. Moving forward, you should take into account a more gradual pace due to the very high shares in these two key markets of now 80 to 90%, meaning that our room, our room to grow additional share is limited in those two key countries. In DMF naive countries, the market penetration requires more time and indication, therefore expect a more gradual increase going forward. Moving to Illumetri, as you know, this is an IL-23 P19 inhibitor and is our first biologic in psoriasis in Europe. Psoriasis carries a high disease burden and patients can have a very significantly impacted quality of life. In such cases, therefore, it is important that any therapy provides long-term control. A short-term fix is not what is needed here. And patients need a long-term treatment strategy to reduce this disease burden and improve their quality of life. You can see from the slide that anti-IL-23 is clearly conquering the market. We are zooming in here on the dynamic segment of the market. There are compelling reasons for that. The anti-IL-23 class has a strong efficacy profile with the key attributes being a proven lasting efficacy with convenient dosing and with no significant safety concerns. Now, if we zoom in to the Ilometri performance, we are pleased with the performance of Ilometri in Q4. You can see the patient data in Germany quarter on quarter, and you see that we are actually tracking very nicely with the uptake. Despite the launch of a new competitor anti-IL-23, we continue to gain patients with Illumetri. We even saw an acceleration in Q4. So this is certainly a very competitive space, but we think that we have a very good product in the right class. The majority of patients require clinically meaningful and reliable long-term control and are less concerned by rapid onset of action. In this context, Illumetri has demonstrated clinically meaningful disease control by absolute and relative PASI with eight out of 10 patients staying on therapy for five years. Importantly, this was achieved without any new or emerging safety signal. With a highly favorable and very differentiated cost-benefit ratio, Illumetri can be considered the therapy of choice for the vast majority of patients that cannot be controlled by conventional systemic therapies. Seitsara, our antibiotic in moderate to severe acne, has seen a very nice uptake of TRX during the first year since launch, reaching 6% market share in the US in the broad oral antibiotic market prescribed by dermatologists by the end of the last quarter last year. 
The strategy has always been to generate a lot of user experience for the dermatologists, thanks to a generous copay offset by Almiral. This we clearly achieved, and we have now established Shaifara as the best-in-class oral antibiotic for moderate to severe acne. We have also flagged that we would start working as of the second year to improve the gross to net by introducing a new, less generous copay offset. This is exactly what we did as of the second week of January. The logical recent DRX decrease is in line with our expectation given the changes to our copay program that we initiated in the second week of January. Moreover, I can tell you that the overall market share of oral anti antibiotics has decreased versus December, and that the Sahara market share already starts to stabilize. Also, you can see from the slide that the absolute number of prescriptions starts to stabilize. More importantly, this expected decrease of prescriptions is actually eliminating the non-covered prescriptions in order to improve the gross to net. Actually, I can tell you that we see already significant improving improvement in the last weeks in the gross to net for January, despite being in the high deductible season, and this improvement should further develop throughout the year. Also, we have announced this morning that we have acquired the rights to Saisara in China, and we are planning to submit Saisara to the Chinese NMTA in 2022. There is a large acne population leading to a, pot a potential of 13 million moderate to severe treated acne patients in the urban population by 2028. This is a large opportunity where we can launch an innovative product into a growing market with clinical development that is largely de risk. Our pricing research shows there is significant willingness to pay out of pocket in tier one and tier two cities, and we plan therefore to launch in such an out-of-pocket model, avoiding also lengthy pricing and reimbursement discussions. Entering into the late stage of our pipeline, we have made excellent progress there. We are building the clinical stage pipeline with very exciting products. Here we're talking about Lebrikizumab, Tirvalibulin, and the recently announced BNZ01, with more to follow in the course of 2020 and 2021. I mentioned before, we have also included Saisara for clinical in phase three. Combining the peak sales potential of the recent launches, Skilarens, Ilometri, and Saisara, together with Tirbanibulin and Levrikizumab, gets you an excess of 1 billion euros, another indication of the ongoing potential for transformation of a company that has just reported 2019 product sales of 853 million euros. These peak numbers do not include BNZ01 nor Saisara China. On Lebrikizumab, this slide tells you why we are so excited by this opportunity. Since we exercised the option on Lebrikizumab, there has been only positive news. Upa Sitinit received its registration in Rheumatoid Arthritis with a black box, and we think it's very reasonable to assume that they will have a black box warning for AD also. We have initiated phase three, even a little bit ahead of schedule, in October 2019. Then two potential competitors dropped out of development. There was the IL-17C from Novartis that was stopped in October 19, and the NTIL-33 from Anaptis Bio that was stopped in November 19. In the meantime, Dupi has obtained market access nearly everywhere in the US, hence opening the way for future incumbents in that indication. And we note with interest Sanofi announcing in December 2019 the global peak sales potential for Dupi of 10 billion euros, which we very much see as an external validation of the potential of Lebrikizumab. And then in December, also Talokinumab hit its primary endpoint, but with no details given. Perhaps of most relevance to Almiral was, of course, the acquisition by Lili of Dermira, which we view as a very solid external validation that we made the right choice when we took the option on Lebrikizumab. To expand a little bit more on Lebris potential, we are pleased to see the latest report from DRG that supports our forecast for Lebri. In fact, DRG gives sales of 532 million euros by 2028 in a market that keeps growing. I am not sure that the potential for Almiral of this drug is sufficiently recognized by observers. We think that this product has a potential to be best in disease for atopic dermatitis. This graph shows the substantial market opportunity, and the good news is that today there's only one biologic that is marketed, Dupilumab of Sanofi. 
since the launch, they have been able to secure a very good market access for Dupilumab in Europe. This is a positive indicator for Libri, as we will not have to open that market access in the atopic dermatitis space. Instead, we will be able to follow on what Sanofi has already created with Dupilumab. All observers say that the number of atopic dermatitis patients will be at least the same as psoriasis, but with a burden of disease that is probably even more important than the burden of psoriasis. We are excited by the profile of Ledri and what it has to offer for patients, and we are working towards launch of the product in early 2023. I will now pass over to Bouchan to discuss updates in the R&D pipeline. Thank you, Peter. I would like to spend <coughs> some time to go through this slide in slightly more details. To further emphasize why we are so excited about Libricuzumab from a clinical as well as scientific perspective. Here we see three cartoons. One, monoclonal antibody, which is already on the market, like Peter said, dupilumab, and two, under development, lipricuzumab and trolicuzumab. Dupilumab is a monoclonal antibody targeted towards IL-4 receptor, hence submitted to target-mediated drug disposition, which has an impact on the half-life of the antibody and its ability to maintain systemic therapeutic levels within given time. Dupilumab prevents the dimerization of both type 1 and type 2 receptor complexes, thereby blocking type 1 as well as type 2 receptor signaling. That's why the signaling is much more wider. Recent studies have shown, had many publications that say that <coughs> IL-13 is primary cytokine involved in atopic dermatitis inflammation. IL-13 <coughs> is overexpressed locally in atopic dermatitis skin and has significant impact on skin biology, including recruiting inflammatory cells in, at the lesion. Libricuzumab is a monoclonal antibody designed to block IL-13 cytokine with very high affinity and up to four weeks half-life. Libricuzumab specifically binds to an epitope that prevents it from binding IL-13 receptor alpha-1, hence there is no dimerization with IL-4, and formation of type 2 receptor complex and blocking of type 2 mediated signaling. At the same time, it does not prevent the IL-13 from binding IL-13 receptor alpha-2, which is also called the receptor, which is known to have anti-inflammatory properties. The specificity and high affinity of Libricuzumab is very important and has reflected in the clinical outcomes in the phase 2B clinical trials that were already published. Libricuzumab phase 2B data, we see Percentage change from baseline in pruritus at 16 weeks to be close to 65%. Percentage IgA responders by about 40%. If you look at EZ90, which is a very high bar to reach in atopic dermatitis, you see about 44% in EZ90. On the other hand, trolicosumab is also a monoclonal antibody against IL-13 cytokine, but it targets very different epitope. Trilocosumab prevents blocking of type 2 receptor, just like DP, but with a very low affinity. Larger number means low affinity, smaller number means a very high affinity. It also prevents IL-13 cytokine from binding to the IL-13 receptor alpha-2, a DK receptor, thereby blocking its anti-inflammatory properties. These two functional characteristics, low binding affinity and blocking of IL-13 receptor alpha-1 and 2 sets trolicosumab far apart from high affinity and specificity of libricosumab. So in short, given the importance of IL-13 in atopic dermatitis, skin biology and its high targeted affinity, long half-life, and specificity that targets pertinent mechanism of action for atopic dermatitis, 
Liquidation Act presents the unique opportunity for benefiting the patients by improving efficacy, as shown in phase 2B, tolerability, and convenience in long-term maintenance of atopic dermatitis. Now let us talk about the really exciting deal that we have with Binance. As shown in the slide, CTCL, despite the overall long survival rate in the early stages of the disease, the progression rate dramatically increases at 2B, and the survival rate also decreases dramatically. There is an unmet need in these stages of the disease where today's available therapies have very high incidence of side effects and are not tolerated by patients. The patients have to go through multiple treatment regimens um, to survive. Benzy-1 is an extracellular peptide that binds to gamma-C receptor, which prevents its dimerization with IL-2, 9, and 15. It is already in phase 1, 2 for CTCL, and FDA has granted our front drug designation. We will evaluate the results of this particular trial and um, results of pre-phase 3 meeting with the FDA, and at that time, we will execute an option. This will be around end of 2020. Once the option is executed, we will start phase three clinical trial for CTCL in 2021, and phase two for alopecia areata shortly thereafter. Under all, we'll have global rights for Benzy-1. Mynase has the innovative platform technology for extracellular peptides that can inhibit multiple cytokine receptors. The platform technology is already in humans, and has shown target engagement. It is also clinically validated, as we see in Benzy-1. End of this year, when we execute the option for Benzy-1, we will also initiate a research collaboration with the company, thereby they will provide us three IND-approved molecules in inflammatory and or immunodermatological indications in the come three years. We are extremely excited about this collaboration so that we can bring technologies to the market which will benefit the patients. Being said that, I will hand it over to Mike to provide us with financial performance. I'm sorry. Thank you, Vishan. Now I want to take you through the financial part of the presentation. We've delivered what we believe is a very strong set of financial results for 2019. The key highlights are as follows. Total revenues and net sales growing at 12% and 13% respectively, boosted by our recent launches and a full year of our U.S. portfolio, mainly boosted by Axone 7.5. We have positive evolution of the gross margin with a year-on-year -year improvement driven by our improved product mix. We have made significant investments in key product launches, helped by reallocating savings from the divestment of our aesthetics business. With this, we delivered a strong operating leverage with EBITDA growth of 45% and a major improvement in the year-on-year -year margin. And this has helped us to achieve an excellent operating cash flow of 276 million euros, aided by significant collection of milestones from AstraZeneca, primarily in Q4. When looking at Q4 2019 versus Q4 2018, we see sales flat and profit improved mainly due to lower G&A, R&D expenses. Gross margin was down mainly due to a reallocation of wholesaler fees from the new U.S. portfolio to SG&A from a reduction of net sales in 2019. On this page, you can see the main contributors to net sales over the period. In particular, I want to highlight the strong contribution from our recently launched products as the ramp up of Illumetri and Cesara in the first year since launch has managed to hit our internal targets. We forecast a continued meaningful contribution from these products in the near term as we continue to gain penetration in key geographies. We have achieved strong net sales growth of 13% in 2019, which is very much aligned with the guidance given. Taking a look at the P&L in detail, you can see the 13% net sales growth that I mentioned, and in addition, gross margin achieving 71% due to 
driven by favorable product mix. Other income was stable versus last year. Moving forward, we will see a significant reduction in other income as milestone-related income from AstraZeneca decreases sharply, and we switch to a predominantly royalty income model. R&D increased this year versus 2018 by 5%, due mainly to an increase in Phase 4 studies for the recent launches. We achieved a 6% decrease in SG&A spending versus last year, though when you consider the divestment of the aesthetics business, the IFRS 16 changes, and the wholesaler fee reallocation underlying uh, SG&A increased by high single digits. We will discuss this in more detail on the next slide. All of this led to an excellent EBITDA growth of 45%, with an important improvement in terms of EBITDA margin from 28% to 46%. Looking deeper at SG&A evolution in 2019, you can see over the year we continued to manage SG&A expenses tightly overall, while investing in our recent product launches. We benefited from meaningful savings following the divestment of our aesthetics business during last year. As you can see in the other column, the reclassifications mentioned during the 2018 year-end call, amounting to roughly 16 million related to lease accounting implementation and a reallocation of wholesaler fees in the U.S. to net sales, aided the reduction of SG&A versus 2018. In 2020, we anticipate mid to high single digit increases in SG&A, excluding uh, depreciation and amortization, to support our launches and continue the investment in our growth drivers. Going down the P&L, the combination of growth, improved product mix, and limited expense increase provided operating leverage with solid EBITDA and EBIT margins increase. 2019 saw an effective tax rate of 17%, in line with our expectations. In 2018, due to the Allergan portfolio acquisition, we ran a new impairment test evaluation, and as a result, some tax assets linked to the previous U.S. impairments were reinstated, and that's why 2018 had a small income in the tax line. With this, we generated a normalized net income of $136 million and a normalized earnings per share increase to $0.78 cents per share, up 53% from last year. Looking at the balance sheet, I simply want to highlight two elements. One, an increase in intangible assets following from the Dermira payment for Leverkizumab, as well as additional investment in the Athenex product. And I also want to say that we finished the year with leverage of 1.5 times EBITDA to net debt, which gives us a maximum flexibility for additional M&A activity going forward. Let's have a quick look at the cash flow statement. We delivered a strong operating cash flow, generating $276 million from good collection in Europe and the U.S., which we were pleased with important conversion rate and improvement versus last year, boosted by milestones received from AstraZeneca. Investments include the Demira option and exercise fee, as well as uh, additional down payment on the Athenex product. For 2020, I want to show a summary slide of the guidance assumptions that we're using uh, for the year. This shows uh, our view of some potential impacts to the business this year, both positive and negative. There are multiple moving parts. However, overall, we anticipate an increase in the net sales as products continue their rollout across Europe and the U.S. strategy for CESARA to optimize profitability starting in January begins to bear fruit. I've already mentioned in some detail the future expected trend for other income and that we intend to invest to support our recent launches, which will lead to a mid to high single digit increase in SG&A spend in 2020. As you will see, be aware, given that we've flagged it uh, for some time, there is a generic uh, launch for Axon 7.5 in the U.S. that will impact us this year. There's one additional impact area that could adversely uh, affect us in 2020. Our Spanish division is strong and a, a very profitable part of the business. We have a new government in Spain, and there, there could, while there could be new measures, there have been nothing announced yet so far, but it would be remiss for us not to mention the possibility that it would least some adverse impact this year or next could, could happen. At, having said that, we have received no details yet of any proposed measures, but we'll let you know once something concrete uh, is, is launched. 
With the previous uh, assumptions uh, presented, I can give you our guidance for 2020. We expect net sales of low to single digit growth. Uh, in terms of EBITDA, we expect to be between 260 million and 280 million for the full year, with a growth in the core EBITDA, as I will explain on the next slide. We have given a relatively wide-ranging EBITDA for this year as we want to have caution because it's firstly, we don't know if and when the Spanish government may implement any measures, and secondly, the speed of the generic uh, um, launch of the Axon 7.5 is not known at this point. These are the lo two largest swing factors in the range of the EBITDA for 2020. Here I want to provide a slightly different perspective on the company's transformation. When looking at EBITDA, including excluding other income, what you can see is that the core EBITDA has been growing in all of the last few years, while the significance of other income has been declining. As we mentioned in 2020, the other income will be mostly a royalty model, and given the current performance of the underlying products, we expect this to be significantly lower than in the past. We expect core EBITDA in 2020 to be growing despite the impact of Axon Generics. And finally, on this slide, uh, we want to re reiterate our priorities when it comes to capital allocation. First, our priority goes to invest behind the new product launches, building our European psoriasis franchise and the U.S. Acne franchise. It's clear that what we've created for ourselves is a lot of opportunities. Second, we are focused on strengthening our R&D pipeline, which is at the core of being a specialty pharma company. We've made very good progress, as Peter and Bouchon have explained. Third, we want to provide a secure and stable uh, growth dividend to shareholders. At the annual general meeting on May 6, 2020, the board of directors will propose a gross dividend of 20.3 per share in script dividend um, stable versus last year. Finally, we will focus on M&A uh, for accretive deals that will reinforce our core business and bring critical mass to further leverage our fixed cost base. With that, I'll now pass back over to Peter to conclude the presentation. Thanks a lot, Mike. So, in closing, I would just say that we think that the strategic transformation at Alamiral is now firmly underway. With the European Psoriasis franchise and Cesara in the U.S., we have created a very good momentum. Looking at our pipeline, we have now a very attractive number of late-stage opportunities with significant future leverage on our growth profile. Then, as you've heard from us before, a key component of our strategy remains to search for additional external opportunities to further complement our current growth profile and generate sustainable value for shareholders. Finally, we expect top-line growth at low to mid-single digits in the year, our biggest product in terms of sales, Axel 7.5, goes generic. This shows that the underlying performance of the business remains strong and demonstrates our significant leverage for midterm growth. So, Pablo, I hand back to you for the Q&A session. Thank you, Peter. Jovi, please, back to you for the Q&A. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad and wait for your name to be announced. Our first question is from Chuan Hyung from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks for taking my questions. I have a few if I can. Um, firstly, on 2020, do you see growth in the US DERM portfolio for 2020? Uh, and what products beyond Cesara do you see that growth in? And can you outline the Spanish portfolio impact if the government chooses to implement these cost measures? And secondly, on Cesara, you note scripts are starting to stabilize. Uh, is today's level now the bottom, or should we continue to expect a decline? And how long do you think it takes to get back to the level you were previously at? Um, on your other growth drivers, if you have a look at Illumimetri and Skillerance, quarter-on-quarter -quarter sales growth seems to have really slowed. What can really get the sales growing, going for these products? And are you still confident in your peak sales forecast for these products? And finally, just a quick model in one. Uh, you've been helpful on the level of SG&A growth. Can you please be helpful on the level of R&D growth? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Trung. There's actually five questions. Let me take the, the Cesara question and the other growth drivers. So basically the psoriasis franchise in Europe first, <clears throat> and then I'll turn it to, to Mike for the other questions. Um, so on, on prescription side, Sarah, uh, if, if you look at the evolution, it's, it's, it's true that we, uh, we see the bottom 
uh, coming close. Um, I think what you should also take in mind when you look at the, the evolution over the last weeks is that you should really take the, the point of 3rd of January as the starting point and not the, the peak you saw on 20th of December, which is typically a peak in the US uh, of, uh, of the Christmas season for acne. But we really only dial back on the copay card after the 3rd of January. So this should really be the base. Uh, that's my first comment. My second comment is actually that, um, yes, you saw the erosion of the Saisara prescriptions, but it's also a typical pattern that in the first weeks of January, the overall on oral antibiotic market also decreases. So what we see actually in market share in the last weeks in the oral antibiotic segment, we see actually that we have already a flat market share since two or three consecutive weeks. So if you take all these factors together, I think we're probably very close to the bottom and we can restart growing from this new base. Um, number two, on the other growth drivers, actually, um, uh, we are very excited about Saisara and I really, uh, sorry, about uh, Idometri, and I really invite you to look at the uh, patient growth of the unit growth Q4 versus Q, uh, Q3. Uh, as, as demonstrated in the slide, we even had an acceleration in the, in the new patients uh, putting um, or being treated with, uh, with idometry. Um, and uh, if you would normalize uh, the, the sales of idometry for the price decrease in Germany that we had, we're actually looking at 22 million sales. So uh, I, really, I really invite you to look at uh, idometry through this lens. And, um, and this is basically only um, Germany sales because we're just in the phase of launching in countries like Austria, Spain, Italy, we launched last week. Uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, later during the year, we'll also launch in France after the summer break. So uh, I think we're very, very optimistic on, on Idometri uh, and together with the continued gradual growth of, um, of Skillerens, uh, we do confirm our global peak sales of the two products combined of 250 million euros. So I'll now turn to Mike for the other questions. Yeah, so let me try to go through them, and, and if I miss anything, just, just let me know. So for 2020 U.S. Derm, um, we're not going to give detailed numbers about the whole portfolio, but I think it's safe to say that we expect the, the generic impact on Axone to be slightly more than the growth of the other products. So the, the U.S. overall derm portfolio will face a slight decline. Um, in terms of other growth drivers there, um, I think, you know, turbinibuline when it's launched uh, in, in 2021 will be a nice growth driver. The remaining part of the portfolio uh, that we acquired from Allergan has some, some small growth in some of the products, but some others facing uh, some generic competition. If I move over to the Spanish portfolio uh, impact, uh, we're not giving any numbers directly on that because we don't have anything uh, concrete in terms of, uh, of measures yet. But safe to say that, uh, that if we do have a significant impact, it will put us more towards the lower end of our guidance range than the higher end of our guidance range. And then overall, the last question, uh, we did give guidance on SG&A. For R&D, we would expect a, a small increase, uh, low single digits to uh, mid-single digits at the, at the upper end of it as we continue to fuel uh, the, the studies needed for not only phase four for the, the recently launched products, but, um, but we are moving other things through the pipeline. Thanks, Thanks very much. Next Our next question for today is from Francisco Rubis from Exxon. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I have uh, three questions. The first one is a uh, follow-up on, on the Spanish uh, measures. Uh, so could you confirm that you have already included in, in your guidance? Uh, the second one is uh, if you could give us the detail of how much of the other income in 2019 come from AstraZeneca, both for rural days and milestones. And the third one, if you could detail what are the earnouts and milestones uh, that you have to pay in 2020 uh, or what, what the one that you already know? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll take the first question on the Spanish measures. So yes, we, we confirmed that we have, uh, let's say, call it a placeholder in our guidance for potential uh, Spanish measures. And as Mike just explained, if those measures materialize, this will drive us to the lower end of the guidance. If not, this will drive us to the higher end of the guidance. Um, but I think it's too early to really give you more color on that today. The only thing I can, I can tell you is that we have we have conservatively planned for that. 
Uh, Mike, the questions on other income 2019 and earn out. Yeah, so for the other income 2019, the majority of that income, it was all from AstraZeneca in the line other income, and uh, the majority was was still the amortization of, of milestones uh, from, from previous years, uh, as well as the cash that was actually collected in Q4 this year for the, uh, the combo launch in the U.S. Uh, going forward, we really don't see significant milestones in that line, and it's really just going to be royalties on, on the products um, that, that continue to be sold. Um, unfortunately, that, that product portfolio has been declining, um, and as, as of now, we haven't seen any rapid growth of this new combo launch. So, so we'll keep a close eye on it, but at this point, uh, you know, what we're guiding towards is, is what we see in that line. Um, and in terms of cash, uh, most of the cash came in in 2019. There is another cash milestone coming in in 2020, but it's related to income that's already been recognized. Thank you. And about the, the earn outs of uh, product, uh, system products, sorry? We don't have any other milestone earn outs other than the royalties. Okay, thank you. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, it's star one for any questions. Our next question is from Peter Welford from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, thanks for taking my questions. A uh, couple, for firstly, just with regards to uh, the China in licensing and Cesara, just curious if you could talk a little bit about uh, what you already have in China, I guess, and, and whether or not uh, beyond that then in the future, are there other opportunities you're looking out to, to potentially either capitalize on existing products in the portfolio going into China, uh, or alternatively, um, is this an area that you're looking externally to source assets to, to build up, I guess, ahead of time for Cesara, uh, something to leverage with, with the Cesara launch? Um, secondly, then, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about the, the sales perhaps you have in Spain. Uh, maybe I missed it in the presentation, but be curious guess, to know what, what is your sales number in Spain. Uh, now, I think you mentioned that the profit of the business is very profitable. Is it fair to assume, therefore, that the, uh, the profitability of, of the Spanish business is above the group average, uh, and any sort of uh, visibility you can give them that would be great? And then, just thirdly, on SG&A, obviously, mid to high single digits increase, you said, this year, which is very helpful, uh, because obviously these products roll out. I guess if we look in the future, I appreciate you're not going to sort of give mid-term outlook, but we obviously have then, if we think about it, um, the activity teratosis coming next year. Uh, we then potentially have, I guess, lebrokizumab in early 23. I guess, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what, what sort of increases we should think about, or, or I guess maybe another way, what sort of point do you think we could reach the point where we should really start seeing leverage through that line? Um, given, obviously, you're getting a portfolio effect. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter. Three questions. I'll, I'll take the first one on China and, and give you a little bit more color. So, um, actually, today we have presence on some of our legacy brands in, in China with, with the classical distributor model. So, so that is, uh, of course, no base to, to build a, a, a kind of a new uh, presence on new activity in China. Um, but what we what we have started to do now with Cesar is really planning for a more strategic entrance into China, uh, either with our licensed products, either with our uh, pipeline products. Think about, for example, BNZ01, uh, rare disease, um, high end medical need, uh, you know, relatively few referral centers for CTCL. So these are typically the, the products that could come fast to China because they benefit from a, from a fast development and then benefit from a fast uh, pricing and reimbursement discussion. So basically what we do now in all our internal uh, research programs, we systematically put, re uh, put, uh, put uh, China into the equation. And of course, the, the first one uh, should be Saisara, not only because, all, but also because uh, we plan, as I said before, a targeted approach uh, in uh, tier one and tier two cities uh, in a, in a non-reimbursed setting, and and we have thoroughly tested willingness to pay, and that willingness to pay is clearly there uh, for a treatment that takes uh, let's say one to two to three months. Okay, so um, now we have not decided, and and I think we have a bit of time ahead of us, but we have not decided uh, what would be a go-to market model uh, for us in China. Uh, we would probably, at least in the first step, not do that alone. We would probably make a strategic alliance with a partner, uh, or we can look at other solutions whereby we have a, 
company servicing us for a couple of years, and then once we had achieved critical mass, we could firmly establish ourselves in China. So it's a little bit early days, and, and we are looking at different go-to-market models, Peter. But of course, when, when we get more color on that, we, we, will, uh, we will, of course, um, discuss this. Uh, Mike, the, the two other questions, sales in Spain, and then the long, longer-term outlook on SGNA. Yeah, so in terms of our business in Spain, um, it, it's well over 200 million euros in sales a year. Um, not all of that would be potentially subject to any measures because we do have a significant consumer health business in Spain. Um, but we, we do see a basket of, of roughly 100 million in sales that could be subject to, to anything that, the, that uh, comes as reforms in Spain. Um, the profitability of that business is pretty much in line with our overall global profitability. So it's a very good piece of business for us, um, and we just wanted to flag that risk as an unknown. Uh, when it comes to SG&A, um, we do expect uh, the increases to, to temper a little bit in, in uh, 2021 and 2022. Uh, now, 23, we don't know yet because uh, the launch of Leverkizumab could, could uh, be a significant one. But, but um, when you look from 18 to 19 and 19 to 20, you've seen you know, uh, new launches and then some building of, of infrastructure. And uh, we're starting some, some pre-launch uh, spending for turbinimbulin in, in 2020. That will start to moderate as you go into to, to the midterm and then probably um, accelerate again once we have leverkizumab in the market. Um, we're, we'll be looking, you know, of course, to, to, to be as tight as we can and, and to, to really manage that well. But in order to launch uh, the new products and expand in, in some territories where, where we're not uh, yet in the critical mass, we do see some increase in SGN. Thank you, Peter. Next question, That's great, please. thank you. Sorry, must be. Next question, please, Yes, the next question uh, is a follow-up from Truong Yang from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Um, just two more from me, if that's okay. Um, so, firstly, uh, the EMA recently recommended halting the use of Picato on a possible skin cancer risk. Has the EMA asked you for any additional data on turbinilin ahead of the approval? And do you have any long-term data or long-term trials planned if the EMA asks you for that data? And then just uh, a financial one um, on your net financial charge for 2020. Uh, for, for 2019, of the 21 million net financial expense, uh, 13 and a half was foreign exchange, 2.7 was fair value adjustments. That leaves us with 4.6 net finance. Is that a reasonable run rate for 2020? Thanks very much. So thanks, Jim. I'll, I'll turn it first to um, to Bouchard for the, the question related to Picato and EMA. Yeah, we have submitted our file to the EMEA. Um, as a routine, they have asked us to submit a protocol for long-term safety and observation of squamous cell carcinoma clinical trial. The protocol is already with them, and we will hear from them um, by third quarter this year. Um, they have not recommended anything special uh, for us to do as a result of the Carter um, trial. Now, I would add to that that actually, uh, before any news of Picato, that was actually our um, base case scenario that EMA would ask for those uh, long-term studies. Uh, we knew that from the get-go, so there's no change. And number two, the, the mode of action of uh, Tiervanimulin and Picato is completely different. So. Uh, if any we true of the, let's say, the EMA Picato decision, it's, uh, I think it's a positive to us because it's one competitor less. And Mike, the, the question on net financial charge? Yeah, so the net financial charges are a little bit complicated, but let me walk you through what, what we had in 2019. Um, in that 21 million, there was about 6 million that was related to the write down of some of the receivables uh, that came from the Thermid investment. So you only had about 15 of, of real financial expense. And some of that is offset by the financial derivative income that you see for the convertible bond. The, the accounting is complex in that you recognize a, an implicit interest, but then you have a, a gain on, on the value of the convertible bond over time as we get closer. So overall, we had net financial expenses, if you count the uh, financial income derivatives and expenses of $13 million. We would expect that to, to come down a little bit, but of course that will be influenced a little bit by the value of some of these derivatives, the equity swap, and, and the convertible bond.
Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. The question. Uh, there are no further questions, sir. I'll hand the call back to yourself. Thank you, Jody. We are not going to close our Q&A session, and with this, we will complete our conference today. We want to thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>